Before we jump in to today's episode, I want to tell you about something new and something cool that we just made for you. I wrote it myself. Now, here's my assumption. If you are listening to this podcast, it probably means that you want to build long-term wealth with a rental real estate portfolio, and you would probably like to do it with some creative financing. And as I talk to people who want to do that, I know a lot of questions come up. And I thought there's really no great single resource that really captures the entire picture of how that works. But I have solved that problem because I have written a new PDF that is just for you. And it's called the step-by-step guide to buying your first or next rental property without relying on a lender to approve you for a loan. Uh, like I said, I wrote this thing myself, and if I do say so myself, it's it's pretty thorough. And in this, you're going to learn a few things. I'm going to teach you about the three key strategies to find and negotiate quality off-market real estate deals that n- nobody else even knows are for sale. I'm going to teach you about what I call the yeses framework for getting off-market sellers to accept your offers. And then I'm also going to teach you the 11 simple steps that you need to take to get your first or your next deal accepted without needing to go to a bank and apply for a loan and just hope that they give it to you. So if you would like to get this free downloadable PDF, just go to rentalwealthguide.com and you can download it right now rentalwealthguide.com and get your download of the step-by-step guide to buying your first or next rental property without relying on a lender to approve you for a loan. Now on with the show. Successful real estate investing isn't all about we buy houses and motivated sellers. That's the lowbrow approach and it gives real estate investing a slimy reputation. Gross. There is a better way, a more genuine human approach. We are thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs, and this is Sleaze Free Real Estate Investing. This is Jeff from the Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur. Welcome to episode number 13 of Sleaze Free Real Estate Investing, a show for those of us who never felt at home in the We Buy Houses crowd. In this show, we take a stand against what we call the lowbrow approach. That's the mainstream guru seminar distressed seller approach that ends up giving real estate investors a slimy reputation. Instead, we discuss the strategies, tactics, and philosophies that we call the thoughtful way, an enlightened approach to real estate entrepreneurship that focuses on constantly sharpening the sophisticated real estate entrepreneur's three most critical capabilities, seller relations skills, deal architecture skills, and opportunity vision. When all three of these capabilities are successfully in motion, you can make an excellent living today and build long-term wealth while creating value for everybody that you touch along the way. Show notes for today's episode can be found at www.thoughtfulre.com slash E13. Please do yourself and do us a big favor by hitting the subscribe button in your podcast app and also rating and reviewing the podcast. Give us your honest feedback. It really helps other fellow thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs find the show. In the last episode, we discussed the second part of a two-part story about an epic acquisition uh, I recently did on my first commercial building. It took place over the course of 15 months, and it required buying two ends of the same building from two different sellers in what turned out to be quite difficult transactions with a lot of maneuvering. So go back and listen to those if you haven't already. I think you'll find the story interesting and fascinating, and I think you'll learn something from it as well. In today's main course, we're going to be discussing something that I call deal feel. But first, I actually want to give you a couple announcements. Announcement number one is that we are just about to launch a brand new webinar. And the webinar is called How to Earn an Incredible Living and Build Lasting Wealth in Real Estate by Mastering the Uncommon Art of Seller Relations Skills Without Working Harder or Doing More Deals. What you'll learn in this free webinar presentation is three main secrets. Secret number one is how to easily uncover the hidden motivations of every seller. Secret number two is how to confidently meet face-to-face with the seller and come across as a trustworthy pro. And secret number three is how to market to sellers in a way that makes the phone ring and helps you buy properties that nobody else even knows are for sale. 
To register for this free webinar, just go to www.sellerrelationsmastery.com. And the second announcement is that we have created recently a brand new, totally free Facebook group for thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs. And we'd love to have you join us for some lively discussion about the thoughtful way of doing real estate entrepreneurship in that group. So just go to Facebook and search for Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneurs and request to join. We look very forward to getting your request and getting you approved and into the group. And now for a little bit of food for thought. Because as always, Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneurs, we like to keep feeding our minds with things to think about. And here's what we're thinking about today. This is based on a quote that I heard recently and that's been keeping my wheels turning quite a bit for the last couple of weeks since I heard it. First, just a little bit of context for you. Over the last few months, I had been feeling pretty financially tense. I'd been feeling uh, like we'd, we'd had a lot of cash eating projects going on and not a lot of cash generating projects. And the things that were going to generate cash were a little bit delayed and coming in uh, at a different time than I thought. And I was feeling a little bit uh, like I was running low on cash more than I wanted to be or expected to be. Now, this is really more about liquidity, not profit. It's not that our projects were going bad by any means. It's just that um, they were all happening at, at a similar time that was using cash faster than cash was being replenished. So I was starting to feel a little bit concerned and worried about that. So I had happened to pick up the audio version of a book written by Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone is, if you don't know him, um, a sales expert guru and uh, also a real estate guy. And he has this book written several years ago called If You're Not First, You're Last, Sales Strategies to Dominate Your Market and Beat Your Competition. So this book is actually written to be about sales during a recessionary period. He wrote it back during the, uh, the Great Recession a few years ago. Um, but mentally, even though even though we're not in a recession right now, mentally, I, I was feeling like I was in my own personal recession. So it seemed very relevant to me. And I listened to it. And what's funny about Grant Cardone is his style and his tone is, is quite different than mine. He may come across to some people as kind of brash, but I, I will be darned if I didn't find it super motivating and super encouraging to get out and stir up opportunity. But the quote in this book, that he said was, he said, look, you don't have a money shortage. What you have is a people shortage. And that really struck me. It hit me hard and made me realize that honestly, I keep to myself too much. I'm not out and about talking to people and seeing people as much as I should be. I, I am out and about talking to people quite a bit, but not nearly as much as I could be if I really made that my number one focus. You know, in our business, we're really looking for uh, connections with three types of people, sellers, people who own property, and secondly, people with money that they want to contribute to a deal in one way or the other. And number three, people who want to buy or rent or otherwise use what it is we have. It could be wholesale buyers, it could be end user buyers, it could be tenants. But the thing that he reminded us in this book, this audio book, was that your whole existing network of people can also be really valuable. Even if you don't know that they fit into one of those three categories, they can still be ex extremely important to stay connected with. Do they know what it is that you do? Do they know what it is that you're looking for? Are you top of mind to them? And it made me remember, if I just simply get out there and be continuously talking to people and better yet, meeting with them face to face, you can't help but have good things happen in terms of new opportunities being stirred up. So if you happen to be feeling a lack of momentum, maybe you're feeling like you're in your own little personal recession, um, then do this. Simply start reaching out to everybody you know. Just simply to reconnect. There doesn't have to be a strategic purpose and don't overthink it. But make the volume of your calls, the volume of your emails, the volume of the contacts that you make, make that your metric. And just see how many people you can reach in a day and make a game out of it. And maybe go ahead and pick up Grant's book or listen to it. I'll put a link in the show notes for you as well. And that is today's Food for Thought. Hey, everybody. Just a quick interruption to tell you about something we've put together for you. I don't know if you've ever heard this funny expression, but a powerful one that says, you can't read the label when you're inside the bottle. Well, 
Real estate investing is kind of like that. When I got started, I was just reading and listening and, and studying everything I possibly could and taking massive action based on that, which was fantastic. But it took a long time, like a long time for me to realize that so much of what I was learning was actually pretty lowbrow. I just didn't have that perspective. And you know, you might be in the same kind of position right now. It's very difficult to know and to see your own situation clearly when you're right in the middle of it. So we've created a free PDF guide available for download. It's just for you guys as listeners to Sleaze Free Real Estate Investing, uh, not available to anybody else. And it's called Five Critical Mistakes That Make Most Real Estate Investors Accidentally Lowbrow. So you can go get this right now if you'd like it, this free PDF guide at pod, P-O-D, pod.thoughtfulre.com pod.thoughtfulre.com. Go grab it and see if you are making any of these five critical mistakes. All right, we're moving on to the main course of today's episode. And today's topic on thoughtful real estate entrepreneurship is what I call deal feel. So deal feel is a term that I made up uh, myself that seems to really accurately capture something I find myself thinking about and focusing on all the time. So here's how I would define deal feel. Deal feel is the art of keeping a very sensitive finger on the pulse of all the various nuanced aspects of an acquisition deal that you're working on. Deal feel is an art, but it's not just a touchy feely topic. It's, it's extremely practical at the same time. It has the ability to really impact the outcomes of your deals in a very practical, concrete, and financial sense. It's really a critical element of the overall seller relations toolbox. And deal feel requires awareness. It's an awareness of situations. It's an awareness of people. It's even a, an awareness of yourself to a certain extent. Deal feel requires sensing and it requires intuition. And it requires reading the nuances of situations by paying close attention and interpreting what you see and hear and experience. So a real estate transaction is a relationship between two people, right? Especially the way that we do it as trees, uh, since we're not really buying properties through agents and brokers, it's really a relationship between two people, the seller and the buyer. And each person comes to this transaction into this relationship with a different, unique set of motivations, concerns, desires, etc. And a real estate transaction, it can't be underestimated that it's, it's a big deal for both parties. I actually often remind sellers of that directly myself. I say, look, I know this is a big deal for both of us. And so we need to be thoughtful as we work on putting it together. And no matter whether you buy 20 properties a year or you're a first time home buyer or you're selling a property, you know, once a year, it's still a big deal. It has big implications, not just financially, but for the lives and the businesses of, of all the parties involved. And we know, because I'm sure you've experienced it like I have, that sometimes relationships can get off track. Sometimes it happens suddenly. Sometimes it happens slowly. Sometimes it happens mysteriously. But when a relationship related to a real estate transaction gets off track, then deals die. And when deals die, that's a problem for us because we make our living and we build our wealth through the acquisition of real estate primarily. So I want to tell you about uh, just kind of an analogous idea. You may know I am a big um, soccer fan. I grew up playing soccer and then once uh, international soccer became easier to watch uh, in the United States on, the TV, on TV and via the internet, it really reignited my passion for uh, the game. So I attend a lot of matches and watch a lot of matches, and it's one of my favorite things to do. And if you've ever played soccer or watched it, you may be aware of a concept in soccer called touch. And I wrote a, an article on the Thoughtful Real Estate blog um, probably a year or more ago now about this idea of touch and how it relates to this. Well, touch is kind of like deal feel and touch in soccer, in my own words is I would describe it as the level of oneness that you have with the ball. And when you have great touch, that means like, it's like the ball is an extension of your body. 
you have unbelievable control over the ball and incredible precision with it. If you take a look at an amazing world-class soccer player like Lionel Messi, for instance, you can you can send any pass his direction. You could just absolutely drill him with a ball, no matter how fast spin is on the ball or height of the ball, pretty much. And he can trap it and bring it down, drop it to his feet like he just cast a magical spell over it or something. And once he's trapped the ball, it's like virtually impossible to even take it from him because that ball is like an extension of his foot. He is 100% in tune with that ball. Well, we can think of deal feel as basically being a level of oneness, not with a soccer ball, but with all the nuances of a deal and constant monitoring of every little nuance of that deal in real time. So in real estate deals, deal feel takes place in two main chapters. There, the first chapter is everything that happens from the, the moment you're introduced to the seller, you know, the moment your letter lands in their uh, mailbox, all the way through to the point at which they've said yes to your proposal and now you're in contract. And the second chapter is what happens from the moment you're in contract to the closing table. We're actually going to spend more focus on the second chapter of this. Getting the yes in the first place is obviously really important, but as trees, we think and talk about you know how to how to make proposals that will be accepted all the time. And rarely do we discuss the continued deal feel that needs to take place throughout the escrow process after you get that initial yes. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And this brings up a really important side note. You know, to most people, especially lowbrow investors, you know, they think that, quote, negotiation is debating the deal points like price and earnest money and contingencies and closing date and things like that. And that once they get a yes, the game is over, that the negotiation has been completed and now they just need to get the property closed. But a tree, you know, we know that negotiation is the entire dance. I mean, from the moment that letter lands in their mailbox to the moment the ink is still wet on the closing documents at the closing table, that entire process is a dance of negotiation. And the relationship dynamic and the need to keep monitoring and managing that relationship dynamic continues long after you get the yes and you put the deal into contract all the way through to you becoming the owner of that property. So let's talk about the first chapter briefly from the introduction uh, to the seller to getting their yes and going to contract. You know, you meet the seller and you immediately begin creating rapport with them. You're making deposits into that relationship capital account. And if that does not ring a bell, go back and listen to the food for thought segment of episode number four of the podcast, where we talk about the idea of relationship capital account being like a bank account where you are depositing goodwill and strengthening your relationship. So you meet the seller, you begin uh, making deposits into that relationship capital account. You get to know them. You, you ask good questions. You listen. You learn what it is that they are trying to accomplish with the sale of their property. And you also read them. You read between the lines, not just hearing exactly what they say, but you're hearing what they actually convey. What do they mean beyond just the literal words that they're saying? You understand how this this deal, this transaction, this property fits into their life. You do your best to understand what's important to them, what the most important thing is, right? Every deal has got one big thing that is the most important to a seller. You learn what their requirements are, etc. And you take all this insight that you've gleaned and you craft a proposal for that seller and you share the proposal with that seller saying, look, I've been listening hard and doing my very best to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And I've tailored the following proposal for you based on exactly what I think is going to hit the target for you. And I'm excited to see if you agree. And I want your feedback and I want to work with you to fine tune this proposal to make sure that it is meeting your needs perfectly. Here's what I propose. And you go over it with them and you work with them and you fine tune it. And ultimately you come to an agreement. And now you're in contract to buy this property. And up through this point, you've been using your deal feel skills and your touch, so to speak, to get to this point. You wouldn't have gotten a yes if you weren't using your deal feel skills and keeping your finger on the pulse of the seller up into this point. 
But now, now that you've gotten your yes, it takes on a new dimension. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this episode. The next chapter, the second chapter is what happens between that yes, when you get into contract through closing. And it's really at this point, I believe that when you're in contract, your deal feel skills really kick in. And this is where the uncommon art of the deal feel skills really, really comes into play. So here's a simple analogy that I'd like to give you. And actually goes back to fishing, which is, um, I say goes back to because fishing is a big analogy that we used in the episodes about marketing and marketing strategies earlier in the podcast. And it's funny because you probably would think I'm out fishing all the time as much as I talk about fishing, but I don't really do that much fishing, but I just find that it provides so many neat metaphors and analogies. So when you put your hook and your bait in the water and a fish bites it, what happens to your line? How do you even know you have a fish? on the end of the line. Well, the, the tip of the fishing pole sort of dips and you can see it and it dips because the fishing line goes taut. And that tautness is a good sign. You know that you gave that fish what they wanted, they bit it, and now you've got that fish on the line. But what happens if, you know, 30 seconds later, you see, you, you see or feel that line go slack? What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean good things. It means the fish is off the line, the fish is off the hook, and you're not going to be able to reel it in and get it in the boat. So the taut line that you have when you're fishing is a healthy piece of tension that you need in order to reel that fish into the boat. Well, it's very, very similar in a real estate deal where your seller is the fish, and you've got this seller on the line now. They've said, yes, you've got them on the line, but you need to get them into the boat. You have to reel them in, and that means getting the deal closed. And this reeling in process and the reeling in timeline is your escrow period. And one thing, if you've ever done any real estate deals before, you know things can change during the escrow period. Things that you want to change can change during that period. Things you don't want to change can, and all sorts of unexpected things, because time is passing and things happen when time passes. One of the main ideas here is that the best way to to solve problems is actually just to avoid them in the first place. And the idea of deal feel and developing and cultivating that art is something that's going to help you avoid problems rather than help you figure out how to solve problems. You will have fewer problems to solve in the first place if you use your deal feel skills well. During this escrow period, you are likely going to be doing some due diligence and you may have findings that you need to discuss with the seller that may involve renegotiating certain elements of your agreement with them. This is one of the major points at which things could go sideways if not monitored and managed well. So when your seller says yes, at that moment, these line, this line is taut or these multiple lines, I'm going to tell you, I think there's several lines and that they're taut at the moment they say yes. And your goal is to keep the lines taut all the way through closing, because that's how you know you're going to get it closed is if they maintain a level of tautness. But now I want you to visualize that you're not just fishing with one line on your seller, but you actually have several lines that you need to keep taut at the same time. And those, these multiple lines, these multiple fishing lines, these multiple hooks that you've got in your cellar and the lines between you and them represent the different nuances and the different sort of categories and elements of the deal. And I find that there are generally five lines that we need to become aware of and to keep taught. Those five lines are number one, the relationship line. Number two, the emotional line. Number three, the rational line. Number four, the life happens line. And number five, the next chapter line. So I want to take a moment here and we're going to go through each of these five lines individually. Okay, so the relationship line. The, the relationship line is the dynamic between you and the seller interpersonally. And so the, the, the seller felt very good about you personally when they said yes because you'd been making those deposits into the relationship capital account and it paid off and they felt very good about you when they said yes. And the important point here is that they have to continue to feel good about you and the relationship they have with you. 
especially if there's going to be seller financing involved in this deal. And as a tree, there is more often than uh, it is for lowbrow investors. It is especially important that they continue to feel very good about who you are. I recently had a situation where this particular element of the deal, this particular line went slack and it went, the whole deal went sideways on me completely out of the blue. And I got to say, like, I think without patting myself on the back too much, I'm pretty darn good at this. This is one of my real strengths. I think it's one of the keys to whatever success that I've had has been deal feel and having good deal feel skills, especially with the relationship line. And still, this just totally hit me out of the blue. And I don't know exactly even what happened. But once I presented my due diligence findings back to the seller and said, Hey, I've, I've discovered a few things here. I would like to discuss with you that set off a chain of events that killed the whole deal. Uh, I think in hindsight, she took these findings personally, almost as if it was a personal attack or if I was saying that I'd found a defect in her or something like that, even though we were talking about things like foundation and electrical systems and whatnot, I think somehow she took this as if I was attacking her and it just absolutely killed our interpersonal dynamic and it killed the deal. And I was stunned and I'm still unpacking, even trying to figure out exactly what happened and exactly what I can learn from that. But the relationship line is one that you have to manage so closely. And up until that moment, I felt like that line was nice and taut and perfect. Couldn't be any better. And then just so suddenly it went slack. The emotional line is the way that their heart, the seller's heart, is feeling about the decision they made to sell the property. Often, you know, properties are emotional, especially with those who have owned properties for a long period of time. They may have memories that are tied to the property. They may have a lot of nostalgia, uh, sentimentality around the property. There might be life events that were tied to the property. You know, if they are living or have lived in this property in the past, or their kids live there, or they you know, they bought it for their kids to go to, to live in when they went to college or somebody passed away during that time. Life events are anchored to properties many times. Longtime tenants living there, for instance, with whom the sellers had a personal relationship. That's a common one. Feelings of guilt when selling, you know, feelings of guilt about not being a good steward of the property or not being a good steward of the tenants. But people have to get to a, a point where they have peace in their hearts about their decision to sell a property. And I'm working with a seller right now who has a really strong bond with the tenants in the building. It's sort of a fatherly type of feeling, I believe, that he has for these tenants. And it's very important to him to make sure that when he sells the building, those tenants are taken care of. And he's even said that he is planning to set money aside from the sale to give them each as kind of a going away gift. And he's he's had them under market rents for a long time and he wants to continue to see them do well, even though he realizes that the, their rents are likely going to go up when he sells the property, he wants to do right by them. This is really a big issue for him and I have to be sensitive to that issue or I will not be able to get him to say yes. And it's not just when I make my proposal, but it's also throughout escrow. If he senses that as we get towards escrow that I'm moving towards something that's that's not going to be in the best interest of his tenants, that's going to really cause problems in our deal. And I'm going to feel this line, this emotional line go slack and it would kill our deal. The third line is the rational line. This is the way that their head is feeling about their decision to sell. They felt at the time they said yes, that it was a smart thing to do. But the escrow period, one of the risks of an escrow period is that it gives them a lot of time to rethink it and start questioning themselves. It gives them a lot of time to talk with other people like their kids or their CPAs or their attorneys. And ideally, they would have spoken with those people before they said yes. But it does give them more time to start rethinking things. And sometimes the rational line is connected to the emotional line. You know, if they start second guessing things emotionally, they may start looking for rational reasons to justify their uh, emotional changing of their mind, right? Just like they say that we make decisions emotionally and then justify them rationally, the same thing can happen here. Maybe they start focusing on their capital gains 
obligation or they do some kind of a different calculation on that or or they start thinking about boy if i'm providing the financing what's the process going to be like if i need to foreclose or they're wondering if they should have listed the property and they could have got a different price or something like that there are lots of different things that could come up rationally for this seller i once had a, a seller on a fourplex that i was buying and everything was going smoothly and then they started acting a little funny like they wanted to back out of the deal because there was seller financing involved and they started getting worried about what would happen if they got paid off too early and they didn't want to get paid off too early because it was going to trigger their taxes and it was going to screw up all their financial planning around their retirement so they went and talked to an attorney and then i get an email from this attorney saying uh my client may want to bail from the transaction and ultimately we did get it all sorted out by simply um, pulling pulling it all apart and just talking through every concern point by point and getting them comfortable with it. But it was a major risk to my deal. And that deal had implications to me with lots of other things that I was working on. I had several deals that were kind of all interrelated and intertwined. And if that one had gone sideways, it really would have screwed up not just that deal, but a bunch of other related things for me. So the rational line is another line that's important to keep taught at all times. The fourth one is what I call the life happens line. This is where there are other unrelated things in their life that come into play that affect their circumstances and make them now second guess this particular uh, deal that they're doing with you. Because you know every transaction is part of a bigger picture for the seller. They're not just selling this property in a vacuum. It, it's affecting and related to and connected to other parts of their life, just as it is for you as the buyer. And so sometimes other elements of that bigger picture can change and which could be unrelated, but could still screw up your deal. Here's a few examples. What if, you know, heaven forbid your seller is diagnosed with a disease during this period, they start rethinking everything in their lives. What happens if they get into some kind of a legal issue that's unrelated to this, but now they're feeling like their plate is too full and they're overwhelmed and they just can't deal with this at the same time? What if their spouse leaves them? What if the house that they're planning to move into burns down or, uh, or something, you know, it could be anything that comes up, you know, those commercials for the insurance where they say life comes at you fast. Well, those commercials are, are great and on point for a reason. Like that, that's a very, very real issue. And a 20, you know, an escrow period, whether it's just a few days or it's 20 or 45 days or whatever it might be, is a lot of time for life to happen. And so one time I was sitting at a restaurant table uh, negotiating with a, a woman and her husband about a deal. It was actually her property, but he was certainly part of the process of just kind of helping her evaluate everything. And we'd been negotiating for quite a while and we'd been moving uh, nicely towards um, a sense of agreement. And we were just kind of fine tuning some of the final details. And she said to me, she looks me right in the face while we're sitting there in this meeting and says, so one of the things I need to adjust here is we had talked about having the seller financing have an eight year term, but I think I just want to do six years. Uh, Jerry here, uh, that's her husband. Jerry here doesn't know this yet, but there are some new developments with my health and I just don't think I want to go out as far as eight years. And you can imagine the look that Jerry gave her like, what? I'm finding this out at, at a restaurant table with the buyer of a piece of real estate across the table for us, you know, but life had come out her fast. I still don't know exactly what that was, but it absolutely impacted her decision-making about that deal right then. And so that is a line that you need to keep taught and you need to have your finger on the pulse of this life happens line all the time. And the fifth and final of these lines is what I call the next chapter line. This is their level of engagement in what is coming next for them in their life. And again, you know, the deal is part of a bigger picture for them. It's enabling them to move toward something else that they want in their lives and their level of engagement and excitement about whatever that next chapter is for them is a big issue. And the more committed to it that they are, the totter the line is and the more motivated they are to see this deal get done. If you think back to episodes 11 and 12, the last two episodes, when I was buying the building from Cindy and Stan, I knew that their next chapter was really important to them. 
and Cindy was really fixated on uh, this house that she wanted to buy at the beach with her part of the proceeds of the deal. Stan, her brother I knew, was really fixated on getting some cash to solve his own financial challenges. And I knew that the later we got into this deal and the closer we got to closing, the closer we got to them achieving those goals, the less that they would want to risk it all falling apart. In other words, I was expecting, because I understood their motivations, that their next chapter line would get more taut and more taut and more taut as we got closer to closing because they would be further and further and further committed to the idea of what was coming next for them and they would not want to see that slip through their fingers. But what if something on the exact opposite end of the spectrum happened? What if Cindy's deal to buy that beach property fell through? Now all of a sudden my line with her, my next chapter line with her would go slack because the next chapter just uh, fell apart on her end. So now her motivation to get something done with me would be lessened. You know, one thing you'll find with a lot of sellers is that once they have agreed to sell a property, in their mind, they have it sold. And sometimes you'll even hear that language literally with people when they'll say, oh yeah, I sold my property. And they don't mean that they actually sold their property. They mean their property is pending. And you'll ask them, oh, you know, when did you close? What did you get paid? Oh, well, it doesn't close for three weeks. But even their language there indicates that they feel like it is sold. And so that's kind of an important milestone when you get the property in contract is their, the emotional <clears throat> commitment to their next chapter. Uh, the line gets even totter in most cases because they feel like the property has been sold. But monitoring that is super, super important. So what is the benefit of deal feel? And what is the benefit of, of cultivating your deal feel skills and your muscle and that art and monitoring the lines and always keeping your finger on the pulse of the deal in all of these different ways? Well, it certainly gets more deals to closing, that's for sure, because fewer deals are gonna fall through because you're monitoring all of the different elements of risk and keeping a proactive finger on the pulse of those. So you can avoid problems before they become big problems by keeping your finger on that pulse. Sometimes, oddly enough, deals can actually get better throughout the escrow period through continued negotiation. And one of the things that it can happen a lot is that the deal feel allows you to know when to, quote, play your cards. So again, now to a tree, the, the negotiation process is a dance. And the, that dance starts when we first meet the seller and it goes all the way through to the closing documents. And little details throughout that entire process, even up until the day before closing, can certainly be fine-tuned. Nothing is really set in stone. You know, It's not done until it's done, in other words. But what I've found is that when you ask for little adjustments is just as important as what adjustments you ask for. In other words, the timing of when you play your cards can be just as important as what cards you play. And you need to make strategic decisions about when those little negotiation moves, those little cards that get played, when that happens. And you do that in light of the tautness of the lines. And if you don't know how taut those different lines are, you can't make a good decision about when to play those cards and exactly how to play those cards. Again, if you think back to uh, Cindy and Stan from episodes 11 and 12, one thing I mentioned to you in that story is that I learned about a month before closing, five weeks before I was supposed to close, that I was going to need to delay the closing date. Not by a lot, but by about a week or so due to another property I was selling closing. And I just simply would not have the money to buy Cindy and Stan's property until I got paid from this other sale. And I had to just strategically decide when to play that card, when to ask for that little bit of negotiation. And I knew that if I waited until closer to the closing date, I would have more leverage because that line would be so taut with them. They would just be so close to getting their property sold and being able to do the things that Cindy and Stan wanted to do uh, 
that I'd have so much more leverage in my negotiation when I asked for that delayed closing by a week. So I chose to wait to play that card and it gave me a lot more power later than it would have been. Asking for something new in a deal when any of the lines are feeling slack is much more likely to cause that deal to fall apart than anything else. So what happens if you sense a line going slack? And that's your job is to be constantly monitoring it and sensing is something going slack. Well, it means that your risk of your deal falling through just went up, unfortunately. And so what it means is you need to be checking in with that seller and getting a better, closer read on them. If you feel the line going slack, you need to move towards them and better understand what's actually going on so that you can do what you can to make any adjustments. And you may find yourself needing to ask them directly, how are you feeling about XYZ? You know, I'm sensing some concern from you on this topic or that topic and to get them to tell you directly. And then the next question is you're trying to figure out what you can do to make that line taut again so that you avoid a problem or you sense it in advance and you avoid it by simply addressing it proactively and preemptively. Sometimes there are other lines that can be further tightened to offset the slack that you're feeling in one line. Like for instance, if the emotional line feels like it's going slack with you, perhaps pulling the rational line even more taut could help, right? If the seller is feeling like, oh boy, I just don't know if I have the heart and the stomach to sell this property. Uh, I just, you know, my kids are going to be upset when they know that I sold the family home or whatever. You might tighten the rational line by reminding them how well this sale actually fits into their retirement planning plans and their capital gains deferral plans and how it's helping them get to the destination that they're trying to get to. So you're going to tighten the rational line in order to compensate for the slackening in the emotional line. And then the other thing you might just do is you might just need to hurry up and get this deal closed before the slackness in any of these lines becomes a problem. And that's definitely one of the benefits of a shorter escrow period is that there's less time for lines to go slack. So what are the lessons here? Well, the lessons are simple and there's a few of them. Number one is just always be sensing. Be sensing what's going on around you as consciously as you can be. Be aware of the lines. You may even go so far as to create a little worksheet for yourself where you print out the, uh, a little template with each of these five lines and every Monday you look at it and say, how does this line feel right now? And if you get to one of the lines and you say, I don't know how the next chapter line feels, well, that's a clue that then you need to get back in front of this seller and just be constantly monitoring that. You need to reach up and put your finger back on the pulse of that part of the deal to feel how it's going. You need to stay in good touch with people. You can't have any sense of deal feel when you're uh, a long ways away, not talking to them, not seeing them. And so you need to be, you need, you can contribute to your part of keeping the line taut by staying in good touch with them. Don't go for more than just a few days without talking to them. Control the things that you can control to the best of your ability. Keep making deposits into the relationship capital account so that your relationship line is always as taut as it can be. Those are the things you do have control over, so make sure you're doing the best that you can. And remember, overall, you're dealing with people here, humans, and you're a human too. And we humans, we are complex and imperfect creatures. And so we need to constantly be accounting for our own humanness and the effects it can have and trying to just give some margin and a little cushion for that and expect that our humanness is going to come up and be prepared to handle that. So thanks again, as always, for listening to yet another episode of Sleaze Free Real Estate Investing. On the next episode, we're going to be discussing how to prepare for a meeting to renegotiate with a seller after due diligence. So this fits really nicely with our deal feel conversation because this is going to be a critical milestone in your overall uh, transactional relationship with this particular seller. Again, please do yourself and please do us a big favor by hitting the subscribe button in your podcast app and by rating and reviewing the podcast. So you'll know when the next episode comes out and you'll be helping other thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs like you find this podcast.
Reminder that show notes, including a transcript, can be found at www.thoughtfulre.com forward slash E13. And until next time, this is Jeff from the Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur signing off. Thanks for listening to Sleaze Free Real Estate Investing. Remember, solve the person to unlock the deal and solve the financing to unlock the profits.